and welcome to this, which is the reading group. Um, and the paper that we're going to be reading today is the one that's on the screen right now. Uh, also, the, the title is above me. Unstructured Knowledge Access in Task-Oriented Dialogue Modeling Using Language Inference, Knowledge Retrieval, and Knowledge Integrative Response Generation. So lots of fancy words there. Sorry, I can't see my monitor. Okay, levels look okay. Um, I have gotten a lot of questions recently um, about the sort of thing that this paper is working on, which is you have a, uh, a dialogue system or, um, you know, some sort of, of bot you're building and you want it to be able to answer questions based on some body of texts, right? Um, or other types of, of information. And the reason that I chose this picture, this picture, this particular uh, text is uh, I had a very rigorous selection process and it was, I was like, I bet there's a shared task where people are doing something similar. And shared tasks are basically um, a, uh, a bunch of researchers come together and somebody puts together the task, they have the data set, they have the thing you're trying to do, um, everybody does the same task together and then you see who did it best. Um, so I was like, I bet there's a shared task recently and this one is from <laughs> last week. Nick says, again a complex paper. Most of them are, unfortunately. Um, but I don't know about unfortunately, it, it makes sense. Um, and uh, this was the paper from that workshop that the most people had talked about on Twitter. So using that extremely rigorous uh, uh, selection criteria, this is the paper we ended up, ended up with. Uh, and there were a number of papers who uh, talked about the system application or the system building systems to address the task. And the task is this one. So it is the first task of the DSTC9 uh, workshop at AAAI. Um, and this was from 2020, so this was from last year. Uh, and the task is do beyond domain APIs, task-oriented conversational modeling with unstructured knowledge access. Um, and I think I said knowledge bases at some point to somebody, um, if you're here from the, the meetup last night, hi. Um, I don't know that they're actually going to be using a knowledge base. They may just be using relevant text snippets um, based on having read slightly more. I don't read the papers before we, we read them together. So, uh, and then the, the track website is over here. Uh, and the three tasks that they are doing. So before we, we jump into some of the uh, approaches that this, this particular team used, this is one of the teams that did the challenge or the shared task. Um, is to, I'll just read this and then we can talk about what that means. Uh, the challenge track decouples between turns that could be handled by the existing task-oriented conversational model with no extra knowledge. So this is just like regular conversation turns your system could handle and turns that would require external knowledge resources to be answered by the dialogue system. And these are gonna be things that there's no API for. So you have some sort of unstructured text, maybe some sort of information, you need to get that information to answer a user question. You can't just, you know, take some slots and stick them into an API query and get the information back that way. What do you do? We focus on turns that require knowledge access as the evaluation target in this track by the following three tasks. So there's three subtasks to do this. Uh, could you also share some tips on how to write academic papers? Oof, that is uh, involved. <laughs> um, yeah, maybe at some point, uh, perhaps in the office hours, the next time we have a, a researcher uh, on, we can talk about writing research papers. It, it's involved. Usually the way that you learn to write research papers is you do um, a research degree like a PhD. All right, so task one is to decide whether to continue the existing scenario or trigger the knowledge access branch. So you got sort of two subsystems, one, you know, just has dialogue, sort of like what you would use Fasa to do, and the other one uh, gets the this information from this information source. 
uh, for a given utterance and dialogue history. So you know what the person just said, you know the history of the dialogue, what do you do? Uh, and the input is current user utterance, dialogue context, and knowledge snippets. Um, I'm assuming this is like a little bit of text that has some information in it that you're trying to get the information out of. So I don't think you're retrieving the little bit of text, I think you're just trying to take that text and make it human readable. Uh, and then the output is binary class, requires knowledge, access, or not. So should you trigger your secondary system? Uh, and then task two, hi Bobby, says to select proper knowledge sources from the domain knowledge base. Oh, there is a knowledge base, okay. Given a dialogue state at each turn with knowledge access. Uh, okay, so the knowledge base is made up of... So what my understanding of knowledge bases is that, you know, a usual... SQL database is just going to be like flat, um, you know, tabular files, uh, tidy data, if you're familiar with that, uh, that concept. Uh, but a knowledge base is probably going to be more like a graph structure of the data so that you will know, uh, you know, hey, this thing, you know, has these types of relations to these other things, and maybe it's a subtype of this other thing. So it's more of a, it's not like a, a flat, you know, database structure. It's um, more, more flexible and can handle, you know, different types of relationships between things. That's my understanding of knowledge bases. I've probably only ever used one as like an end user. I don't think I've ever like built anything specifically for knowledge bases, so. Docker is updating, wowee, please don't do that right now. <laughs> um, sorry, I got a pop up, I know y'all can't see it. Uh, and they are selecting the correct knowledge sources uh, and then there is a knowledge base that's provided, and then you have the uh, conversation, and you need to decide what piece of information to get. And that should be a ranked list of top K knowledge candidates. And then the final one is knowledge grounded response generation. Okay, so then you just take the information you get and you serve it back to the user um, as some sort of generated response. And these, for the purpose of the shared task, were evaluated using human evaluation. Uh, and they did actually share the results um, in this uh, file, which is incomprehensible to me. I'll zoom in. Because uh, I have no idea what these team ID... I can't zoom in. I have no idea what these uh, team IDs or entry IDs map to. So some people did better, some people did worse, everybody did better than baseline. And that's the task. So... This is one of the teams that did the task. Uh, Robbie says, tidyverse you mean? No, so tidy data is a particular way of storing data in a tabular structure where every uh, observation gets a single row and every quality gets a single column um, and there is at most one piece of information in each cell. So it's a, it's a specific um, technical definition of um, how tight, how T t data, tabular data, can be arranged. Uh, Sundara, I'm from Hyderabad, Hyderabad and glad to promote Raza as a viable technology within my company. Aw, uh, thank you. I uh, hope that we're helping you solve problems. Uh, Nick says, knowledge base can be anything in SQL, NoSQL, GraphDB, Excel. It depends on how you see it. Interesting. Uh, Trog says, maybe they map to IDs on Codalab. I don't know what Codalab is, so M maybe? Uh, and Sundara says, um, you need help with integration uh, to an internal SharePoint site. Uh, I would ask about that on the, the Raza forums. I Do I have a pop-up in this view? I don't think I do. I don't. Um, I'd ask on the Raza forums for that. I've never used SharePoint. Let's read this paper. Uh, and there are a, a bunch of people who worked on this, and uh, this little star here says all authors have contributed equally. So it's a yeah, joint first author paper. Um, and I'm not... I know I'm gonna say some of these names wrong. So these are the authors. Congratulations to them. I'm just going to jump into the abstract. Let me zoom in a little bit. 
Uh, dialogue systems enriched with external knowledge can handle user queries that are outside the scope of the supported database slash APIs, databases slash APIs. In this paper, we follow the baseline provided in the DSTC 9 track 1 and propose three subsystems. Presumably, this is going to be a subsystem for each, ta uh, each task, KDEAK, knowledge, knowledge Factor, and ENDS GPT, which form the pipeline for a task-oriented dialogue system capable of ac accessing unstructured knowledge. So this one, presumably, if this is each of the subtexts, this one's probably going to be like, hey, do we need to look at our knowledge base now? This one's going to be like, this is the relevant information from the knowledge base, and this one's going to be like, here's how we take the, um, the information from the knowledge base and generate human readable responses. Specifically, KDEAK oh, <laughs> performs knowledge seeking turn detection by formulating the problem as natural language inference using knowledge from dialogues. Yes. Uh, databases and FAQs, knowledge factor, um, accomplishes the knowledge selection task by formulating a factorized knowledge document retrieval problem with three modules performing domain, entity, and knowledge level analysis. Okay, so it looks like there might be a little bit of uh, hierarchical modeling here where you select the domain first and then the entity and then the knowledge, possibly. Uh, ENDS GPT generates a response by first processing multiple knowledge snippets followed by an ensemble algorithm that, that decides if the response should be solely derived from a GBT 2 xl model hmm, or regenerated in combination with the top-ranking knowledge snippet. Experimental results demonstrate that proposed pipeline system outperforms the baseline and generates high-quality responses, achieving at least 58.7% um, improvement on blue 4 score. Um, setting aside the blue score, I don't think that's a super good metric right here. Um, I think I can see why people are maybe talking about this on Twitter, because uh, it looks like what they're saying here is after they do all this work to get stuff out of the knowledge base, uh, they f might, uh, maybe they're using like their knowledge snippets to generate as like, because the way that you, you use GPT-2 is you give it like little samples of text and then it generates additional text. So maybe they're using their little, their selected knowledge snippets to generate an additional sample and then they're deciding whether to use that sample raw or not. Um, hi Marco. Uh, some people have more tolerance for risk than I do. Uh, okay. Uh... Brains are visual. Okay. Uh, how to integrate multiple different Facebook pages into my Raza bot? Um, uh, if you can't find anything in the documentation, I would ask on the forums. And uh, there's a tutorial on how to integrate. Ah, thank you uh, for, for hopping in there, Nick. Uh, I'm pointing out the tutorial. All right. So I think the, um, yeah, so presumably each of the teams had a different approach to each of these uh, three parts of the problem, and this is what one team did. Introduction. By incorporating external knowledge sources available on web pages, task-oriented dialogue systems can be empowered to handle various user requests that are outside the coverage of their APIs or databases. Um, and it does make sense that this is the particular thing that this task is around because it was put together by the Alexa team. Um, if you're unfamiliar, Alexa is a, is a voice assistant. Um, from predominantly used with like a little... Uh, device um, in people's houses uh, and it's supposed to be like a very general purpose assistant and if you have an assistant that you want to be able to do a lot of different things probably you're not going to be able to hand build an API for everything so they're like hey how can we just get like information from the web and then use that to answer people's questions. Uh, Rohit uh, recently started using Raza 2.0 and you love it. Oh fantastic! Uh, I think it's a good update. Uh, yeah. Therefore, we set out to create a dialogue system that outperforms the ninth dialogue system technology, DCT, 
this one, uh, track one baseline. And there is actually a paper about the baseline that is referenced in the, uh, the, this repo here. So they're trying to outperform the baseline. I think all of the teams in the task did. The baseline method is a pipeline composed of three tasks. The first task recognizes if a dialogue response requires knowledge outside of a provided MultiWAS 2.1 dataset. MultiWAS is just a, a conversational example dataset. Um, if so, so if the answer can't be found in the given dataset, the second task then retrieves the most relevant knowledge snippets from an external knowledge base. Um, which are subsequently used together with the dialogue context to generate a response in the third task. I don't know what the specific knowledge base is. I'm assuming they're going to talk about it. Specifically, all the three tasks are handled by variants of the pre-trained GPT-2 model. Okay, so actually it looks like what their approach is, is that they are using GPT-2 less than the team that provided the original baseline. Interesting. Formally, the external knowledge base, big K, I don't, you probably wouldn't say a big K, but I'm going to say a big K. It's composed of knowledge snippets K1 through KN. Uh, D is a set of all domains. For the DSTC9 track one training set, D equals hotel, restaurant, train, and taxi. So these are different tasks that someone wants to do with the assistant, like, or different topics around which there are tasks. So probably like booking a hotel room, booking a restaurant, booking a train, booking a taxi. Table one shows examples of the two types of knowledge, namely a domain-wide knowledge snippet directly under a specific domain, so DI equals train, and an entity-specific knowledge, an entity-specific knowledge, an entity-specific knowledge snippet of an entity EI equals Avalon, which belongs to the domain hotel. DW and DE refer to the domains that contain only domain-wide and only entity-specific knowledge snippets, respectively. Okay, so some of the domains, and I don't know which ones, are only going to have, like, information about hotels, and some of them are only going to have information about here are all of these specific hotels that you could book, for example. Um, the... Union. Ooh, it's been a minute since I had to remember set theories uh, symbols. And by a minute, I mean literally since last Friday. Uh, the union of the two is D. So you have information about entities and general knowledge information, but there is no overlap between them. So the domain-wide information and the entity-wide domain uh, information do not overlap. A snippet K consists of the title question and the body answer. Uh, okay, so it's going to have like a like a FAQ format. A knowledge snippet KI is considered in domain if its domain DI was seen during the training of the models. Otherwise, it is considered out of domain. So if your model was only trained on information about booking taxis and trains, and somebody suddenly somebody's asking about hotels, that would be out of domain. The dialogue history UT. So all the utterances over time contains utterance I, where T is a time step of the current user utterance, and W is the size of the dialogue context window. Um, so are you looking at the whole dialogue? Are you looking at, like, the most recent three or whatever? Uh, responses to the dialogue are found in the ground truth, R, T plus one. So U for utterances, R for responses, probably. That's generally what people use. Uh, or they can be generated by a system, R tilde, T plus one. Um, I don't know how to say the R with the wavy thing over it. I think that's a tilde. Arr, plus one. <laughs> I'm going to roll it. Uh, hmm. Question. U is union. Yep. We create a transparent, factorized, generalizable, and knowledge-grounded, task-oriented conversation system with code available. So you could check out their code if you were interested. Multiple information retrieval hypotheses are considered when constructing the response, and this significantly improves results. With the three tasks, when the three tasks are integrated, they significantly outperform a baseline in terms of automated metrics. Okay, so here is their pipeline. They have the dialogue turns, and then they do a domain classifier. So are you talking about hotels or trains? Or what are you talking about? And also that is used as input to the entity classifier. So what, what things are being mentioned here? 
Uh, and actually both of these are going as input to the entity classifier. Uh, which makes sense because if you know, hey, they're talking about trains, you don't need to consider all trains is a smaller set than all hotels and all trains, if that makes sense. Uh, and then candidate information generator. So you know the entity and domain, and then you look stuff up from the API or the database, and also your unstructured knowledge snippets. Although it sounds like they are a little bit structured, right? You know if they're entities or not, and they are uh, question answer pairs is your your knowledge base quote unquote uh and all of that information goes into the knowledge classifier so candidate information ranker classification rule classifier result so this is determining whether or not they need to um get the knowledge from the knowledge base or if they can get it from the API or database or from something that's already been handled in their original system b b building already handled by their original system. Multiple information retrieval hypotheses are considered when constructing the response and this significantly improves results. When the three tasks are integrated they significantly outperform the baseline in terms of automated metrics. Um, so just so far, what's jumping out at me is that uh, uh, breaking this down into multiple bits and then uh, having an ensemble model uh, is doing better than just sort of pushing everything into the, the sausage maker that is a large transformer language model, um, which is very satisfying to me. So I'm excited about the rest of this paper. All right, task one, knowledge seeking turn detection. As mentioned earlier, tax, tax, task one classifies whether information from the database or external knowledge is required to answer a user's query. We introduce K-D-E-A-K. -E Probably this is supposed to be pronounceable, right? K-D-E-A-K. K -D -E -K. K -D -E -K. Kdiak, k, or it could be ok, kdiak, kdiak. Let's call it that. Uh, knowledge seeking turn detection using domain, entity, avi, db, and knowledge, shown in Figure One. The domain classifier helps the entity classifier determine the dialog's relevant entity. We generate candidate information snippets from the selected entity's database and knowledge. Okay, so there's just like, at this point, they're just getting a whole bunch of snippets. Uh, the knowledge classifier ranks and classifies the candidate information snippets. I didn't tweet about this. Anyway, uh, the candidate information snippets to determine whether the database or knowledge answers the user's query. Okay, so... Um, do one of the snippets that we have fit the bill? In the subsequent sections, we illustrate our KDAX model using the example from Table 2. What differentiates KDAX from Table 2 is that its domain classifier can identify domains in the non-knowledge seeking turns and the knowledge classifier's ability to select the relevant API DB information. Where are them tables? There we go. Okay, so let's look at the tables. Was there a table one? I know they referenced a table one. There we go. Okay, so table one. Example of the domain wide, line one, and an entity specific knowledge snippet, line two. TB represents the title and the body. Okay, so here are what the snippets look like. There's questions and answers. So a uh, domain wide thing about trains would be is there a charge for using Wi-Fi? Wi-Fi is available free of charge, assuming that this applies to all trains, which that's cool. I don't think that's true in the US. Uh, it may not be true in other places, but I guess in, in whatever uh, domain that they're, they're working in here, they're imagining that it is true. Uh, and then it's specifically about the Hotel Avalon, are pets allowed on site? Pets are not allowed at Avalon. So this is uh, perhaps what makes some difference is that here that the entity is actually mentioned in the knowledge snippet. Um, so these are the pieces of information that they're looking up. Uh, okay, and then table two. 
scroll down. Excerpt of the last two dialogue turns from the hotel domain with the relevant snippet and database entry. So the assistant says, would you like to book the SW hotel? Uh, and the user says, yes, I can reach the SW hotel by taxi. What breakfast options are available here? So the knowledge snippet is, does the SW hotel offer breakfast? No, we don't offer breakfast. And then there's a database uh, entry about the hotel. So here, um, Given these pieces of information about the hotel, the thing that's most relevant is this, hey, uh, we don't actually serve breakfast, so your breakfast options are none, um, as opposed to being like, yes, here's the address of the hotel uh, in answer to what are the breakfast options. Uh, and then here is the baseline, so uh, I think they're going to talk about the different uh, subsystems or the different variants on their system a little bit later, uh, but the baseline is just uh, GPT-2. They may be doing something else that I don't know about, but... All right. Problem formulation. We formulate task one's domain classification and knowledge classification problems as natural language inference problems, so it's not understanding, it's inference. Um, I'm trying to articulate the difference between those two and it's not going to happen for me right now. The NLA problem deals with a pair of statements, hypotheses and premise. Given the premise, it determines whether the hypothesis is true, i.e. an entanglement, false, i.e. a contradiction, or undetermined. Ooh, something can be true without being entailed. Um, but I think in this case, because it's specifically about the relationship of, between a hypothesis and a, hypothesis and a premise, then I think that does make sense. Uh, for example, if I want to book a hotel is the premise, the hypothesis the user wants to book a hotel is true, and the user wants to book a, ho a taxi is false. We leverage a pre-trained NLI model, Lewis et al. 2019, for classification in task one. Ooh, pre-trained model that's efficient. I enjoy that. Uh, we use the last n dialogue turns for premise genera generation. We pair each premise with a set of generated candidate hypotheses using domain and knowledge labels. We find the NLI approach more robust against unseen domains as compared to the baseline. Okay, so they are, um, so they're using natural language inference, which is, uh, giving them a, I mean, a guess at the relationship between a hypothesis and the um, information provided by the user. Uh, one, uh probably says in India we have Chiobaba, low cost internet. I'm assuming that's on trains. I think the last train I was on in the US, we had Wi-Fi, but it didn't work. So I think that's where we were. Uh, module one, domain classifier. This module classifies the dialogue turns relevant domain. We generate the problem using the following premise template. Uh, Nick says, what is the major difference between an utterance and KS in table two? Are they different data or do they have any relationships? We'll come back to that in a second. Uh, table two. Where was table two? Okay, so I think that, good question. So here the utterance is, this is what the user is, uh, sorry. The utterance is both what the assistant says and the user has said previously which is a little bit confusing, but I believe that's how they're using it here based on their, their formalization earlier. Um, so the knowledge snippet here is something that is in a collection of data that they're looking up. So these are the things, the utterances, that are actually being said to the system in real time. And the knowledge snippets are a bunch of, like a collection of documents that they have somewhere else that they're using to uh, answer the, the questions that the user has and to generate the response to the user. Um, and it happens that the knowledge snippets here are generated in a way that they sort of look conversational, but these exist before the user interacts with the system, uh, and these are created during the user interaction with the system. Um, so really good question. 
where does the hypothesis come from? Great uh, question. I think they're going to talk about it here would be my guess. Um, we definitely haven't read that yet. Mm -hmm. Domain classifier, problem formation, candidate information generation, knowledge classifier. Yeah, I think they're going to uh, talk about that here in, in module four would be my guess. And here they're just talking about sort of generally how they're treating the problem. So instead of being a, uh, you know, sequence to sequence problem where you have an input sequence that I'm guessing is the user uh, and bot utterances and then generating a response, they're, they're formulating the problem differently, I think is why this section is here. Uh, they're fetching data. Uh, yes, so the, the challenge of this particular part of the task that they're working on is, hey, do I need to go to my knowledge snippets and uh, get this unstructured text data or uh, can I answer it using stuff that I have in my database and my APIs, like, um, there is my example, or is it something that I can just like look up in my, in my database, like an address? All right. All right. So we have a following premise template. Oh, this, they're going to answer it right now. Uh, so the assistant says whatever the assistant says, the user says whatever the user says in each dialogue turn to distinguish between the user and system response. Uh, based on the example in table two, the premise would be say the assistant says blah, blah, blah. The user says blah, 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 uh, based on you know, whatever they have. We pair the premise with a candidate hypothesis for each domain using the hypothesis template the user is asking about D. Okay, so the um uh the hypothesis here is the user is asking about trains the user is asking about hotels the user is asking about blah for all of these things that they have you know separate data sources for we feed these pairs into the nli model to find the most probable domain by performing a soft max on each candidate's hypothesis output entailment probability the domain di with the maximum entailment probability is selected for the dialogue turn. So given this input, um, they have this for all the do different domains and they uh, pick the one which the system says it's most likely that if this is true, then also this is true. Or given this, this is true. Uh, yeah, so that's how they do it. <laughs> we didn't even have to wait that long. Uh, and they use a bi-directional and auto-regressive transformers model, uh, Lewis et al. 2019, initially fine-tuned on multi-NLI, so that's a natural language inference data set. We further fine-tune our model on multi-WAS 2.2, which I think is the training data set for the dialogue part of the system, and DCST CSTC9 track one training set on all eight domains of MultiWAS 2.2. Uh, means they are fetching the data, continuing from the utterance on KS, and then checking in the database, and then returning the response. Um, yeah, so that's what they, that's the, the second part of the task. Um, but I think the thing that's challenging here is that they have multiple types of ways of getting the data, right? So there are things that are just like, in the dialogue system, but I think that those things are being stored in this uh, this database or this this structured data where they can be like, hey, I know that I need the address of a hotel, you know, in this postcode, can you give me the, the correct answer for that? And they have structured data. And then they have these unstructured knowledge snippets that are just text, right? They're just flat text, question, answer. Um, when do you need to go to the flat text and when can you look things up in the database? Um, and they have multiple, the, these pieces of information are in multiple places. So like, which one should I go look at, right? Um, I think it's the, uh, the challenge here. And this step that they're looking at right now is like, hey, do I need to go to this unstructured text or not? And they're just trying to figure out whether or not they want to trigger the rest of the processes. Um, and this makes sense in particular because it's probably going to take uh, a little bit longer to go through the whole like 
oh, I do need to get this unstructured data, okay, which piece of unstructured data is the most relevant, which they're treating as a ranking problem, and then okay, given that, I need to, now I need to generate a response from this unstructured data to send to my user, all of which will take up some additional processing time. Okay, for training, we generate the premise and hypotheses using the template mentioned above, this one. Uh, each premise with ground truth domain DI is paired with a hypothesis corresponding to DI and marked as entailment. We also paired the same premise with the remaining hypotheses and marked them as contradiction. Uh, for inference, we use hugging faces classification as NLI based zero shot classification pipeline. Do they have the same information in both then? No, I think they have different information in both, which is what makes this a little bit tricky. And I mean, and the reason that you'd want to do that is if you have a system and you have like your database set up and you can handle things within, you know, a certain domain, certain types of questions really well, but you can't handle these other types of questions that you don't have an API for, how do you extend your system in a way that it still works for the things that you have an API for, uh, but also it can handle these things that maybe you have like a, you know, different data source for and that data source is unstructured text. That's my understanding. I'll say, I have not done this task. Uh, this is my understanding based on what we've read so far today. All right, module two, entity classifier. And we are still working in this, uh, this very first module, which is like, hey, do we, need to, do we need to go to this knowledge source or can we get this from our, from our API that we, uh, that we already know about pretty well? The entity classifier uses the selected domain from the domain classifier to further process the dialog turn in focus. We devise a surface matching algorithm to match the possible entities within the dialog history with carefully designed heuristics. It's good that they didn't design them sloppily. Uh, based on the intuition that the later the entity appears in the dialog history, the more likely it is as the target. Oh, a little recency effect. That's not always gonna be the case, but I think they're treating it as a likelihood here, so. Um, given that it's probabilistic and has wiggle room, probably won't, it won't not work for them. Uh, approximate string matching is also used to incorporate into the algorithm to enhance its robustness to alias matching and misspelling. I have no idea what the surface matching algorithm is. Um, if it's just edit distance, I'm gonna be a little bit miffed that they didn't just call it edit distance, but I guess we'll see. Uh, for instance, SMA is capable of retrieving the entities A and B guest house from seeing A and B, Avalon from seeing Avalon, uh, etc. So they're saying that they can handle, you know, variation between the things they're trying to match and what users said. Uh, approximate string matching is also incorporated into the, oh, we already said that. The selected domain labels help reduce the entity search space. So they're not looking at all the entities, they're only looking at the entities relative to the domain that they've already picked. Which means if they pick the wrong domain, it's gonna be real hard. Following with our example, see table two, the entities corresponding to the hotel domain are searched to see if they occur in the dialogue turn. Consequently, the matching algorithm identifies SW hotel as the entity. Are they gonna talk about the, the SMA, the surface matching algorithm? Sure aren't. Uh, okay. <laughs> I'm just gonna assume that they're using edit distance here. Uh, uh, that's gonna be, yeah, but doing that for every single one of the, um, of the possible entities would take a while. I guess their code is available, so we could go look at it if we want, uh, but this is a, a little bit of an unsatisfying explanation of what it is exactly that they're doing. But also it's already a pretty long paper, so I see why they might uh, um, sort of skim over some of their uh, uh, approaches. Uh, module three, candidate information generator. 
Given the identified entity from the entity classifier, this module consolidates the relevant database snippets and knowledge snippets from the entity and places them into an information candidate poll C entity, which will be used by the knowledge classifier in the subsequent step. So they get a bunch of pieces of information that they think might be relevant. Uh, and then in the next step, they will rank those pieces of information to pick the one that is most relevant. As we observe in Table 2, database snippets are not natural sounding like knowledge snippets, so we pre-process them using suitable formatting before adding them to it. Um, so the, uh, the database stuff is like, you know, it's a... It looks like this, that's not human language, so they're changing it to human language before they add it to the big pile of things that they're sorting. Uh, we also add pseudo candidates to deal with cases where information is not present present in either domain database or knowledge base, e.g. goodbye, I want to book a hotel, thanks, etc. Okay, so they also add some stuff that's like not from the knowledge base. Following on with our example, CIG consolidates SW hotels database and knowledge snippets and pseudo candidates into a candidate pool CSW hotel. And then module four is the knowledge classifier. Uh, uh, Rohit says it's a, a new algorithm. Yeah. Uh, Trug says uh, regex is all the way down. Yeah, I guess it could be. I, I feel like that would be really slow though, especially if they're looking at like because it's matching, right? They have this huge set of entities and they're trying to pick the right entity. Um, and I'm guessing that like multi-waz is fairly big, so there's probably going to be a fair number of hotels. Uh, have I written my own algorithm? Yeah. Uh, uh, Nick says, I'm wondering how they're managing to fetch data information from the schema uh, for the API and database schema, both having different codes to deal with the same code. Yeah, that's a really good question. Um, Mm -hmm. Database snippets are not natural sounding. They get the relevant ones. Okay. I guess that they look up everything that mentions their entity, right? So here, uh, SW Hotel shows up in this text, and here it shows up in the database entry as well. So I'm guessing they're getting just everything that matches the entity that they're looking at. I don't know how this would work for domains, though. Because in this example, they do have an entity, but in the earlier examples, they were like, hey, we don't always have an entity. Yeah, I don't know how they would do it in situations where they don't have an entity. That's a really good question. Uh... Yeah, uh, Truck says <laughs> database uh, entries and API re responses change independently of machine learning models. Uh, difficult to rank such things. Yeah, I think they're just like, you know, <laughs> select star where any field uh, is, is matches this particular entity, which um, is going to work okay if you have like a small number of entities if you've got a really big number of entities or a really big database that's gonna get expensive i guess maybe not if you always have a relevant query cached but still the original query might be quite might be quite spendy um all right knowledge classifier uh, so they've gotten all these candidate responses, I guess from just getting all of the database entries that mention the entity and then all of the uh, knowledge snippets that mention the entity that they're looking at. This module consists of an NLI based ranker for the candidates in the candidate information pool output by the candidate information generator. The dialog turn and focus is used as the premise and each information candidate in the pool, uh, so everything in the entity, so Everything in the pool that mentions the entity is used as, as the hypothesis to form uh, C entity premise hypothesis pairs. The candidates are ranked according to their entailment probabilities. The final classification will classify the turn as knowledge seeking or not. Okay, so 
is, oh, okay. I should keep, keep reading the sentence because otherwise I'm not gonna know what these variables are. Where C top I is the top ranking candidate and K is the set of knowledge snippets. Rank according to their entailment probabilities and what is entailing what? For the candidates in the candidate pool by the candidate information generator. The dialog turn in focus. Okay. So uh so it's an entailment problem, right? So it's a it's an NLI problem where they're like, okay, here's the turn what the user said. Here's all our pieces of information. Um does this turn entail this piece of information? Or is it backwards? Premise. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Does this turn entail this piece of information? Yes, no. Does this turn entail this piece of information? Yes, no. And then um, it's not binary classification, though. It's um, probabilistic assignment to entailment. So what they're saying is, does what's the probability that this entails that? And then they'll rank by the probability that they entail it. Um, and if uh, one of the pieces that has been generated from the uh, the knowledge base that they have instead of this structured database API call is the top ranked candidate. Um, then, then they're like, yeah, they're looking for knowledge. And if they're not right, if the top ranked candidate is something like, uh, uh, thanks or goodbye, or I looked it up in the database, then they're like, no, we don't need to go to the knowledge, uh, the knowledge base to figure out this piece of information is what they're saying here, uh, which I think makes sense. But my question is, if they're already doing ranking, yeah, because they're doing an entailment NLI ranking of how well each of these things is entailed by the um, by the thing that the user said, what's why are they doing the next bit where then they they rank them by how relevant they are? I don't know, maybe they're using something else that's not an ally for ranking in the next step. Uh, yeah, let's keep reading. My promise hypothesis stairs. Blah, blah, blah. Okay, uh, following on with the example, see table two. Uh, the last user turn, yes, blah, blah, blah. Uh, what breakfast options are available there is used as the premise and it is paired with every candidate in the set of pieces of information about the hotel, plus their sort of dummy variables they've added. Uh, these pairs are fed into the fine-tuned NLA model to rank the snippets. The top ranking candidate, no, we don't offer breakfast, is a knowledge snippet. Hence, the user's, uh, ex the example user's dialogue turn is finally classified as knowledge seeking, which means the rest of the process will be triggered. Although I feel like the process could kind of be done here if you just give the answer to the question. Um, but I mean, then why would the rest of the paper be there? As regards implementation, uh, we use the previously mentioned BART model as the base model for the candidate information ranker. Uh, the DS... Oh, so this is for ranking the pieces of information, which is for task two. No, this is what they're doing within task one. Here. I think they're going to talk about, well, let's see what they talk about. I don't need to uh, guess. Uh, as the DSTC track one training set provides a database label for non-knowledge seeking turns, we generate pseudo database labels for the non-knowledge seeking turns using an NLI BART model fine-tuned on MultiWAS 2.0. I guess this is like what database it comes from. We fine tune our ranker model on the DSTC nine track one training set using the pseudo labels and knowledge seeking examples. We follow the same training example sampling and inference processes as adopted for the domain classifier, but without the hypothesis and premise templates. Okay. And then task two is knowledge selection. So task one is, hey, does this person have a question that we can only answer from our knowledge snippets? If yes, how do we figure out what their correct knowledge snippet is? 
but I do feel a little bit like they kind of answered that with their uh, candidate information thing. So I'm curious about what they're going to be doing in task two. Uh, as Tuvac says, uh, bang paper. It's a paper. Uh, how come they're using BART for ranking? They're making it super complex. Uh, so yeah, I think this is uh, a fairly complex approach. Um, so, I mean, shared tasks have kind of, I don't want to call it necessarily a problem, but they have the, the sort of the Kaggle thing going on where you're competing with other people who are doing the shared tasks. So if you are, you know, uh, you're probably going to want to try lots of things out and maybe like add a bunch of stuff and um, winning Kaggle models tend to be very large, very ensemble, um, lots of moving pieces. And I think that uh, this might have sort of a, a similar thing. Um, if it were me, I think the, the inference approach is not a bad one. Um, I probably, at this point, like, be perfectly honest, I think I'd be done after task one and I'd be like, I've got, you know, I'm using this entailment thing, I've got ranked responses, I'm just gonna respond to the response. Um, which, granted, it is not necessarily the case that this response is going to be a valid answer for this question. Um, yeah, and I don't know what they're doing about turns that don't have entities, which is something that uh, could be potentially a problem. Uh, did they mention what ranking technique they're using? So um, the ranking technique that they are using previously is that they are ranking the responses, so all the pieces of information that they have generated or collected based on how uh, likely it is that this, this BART uh, model uh, recognizes that they are entailed by the premise, and the premise here is the user utterance. But yeah, it's uh, got a lot of moving parts. Uh, and I think I'm just honestly gonna like kind of skim section two because I am, uh, I'm enjoying this paper. I don't know that I want to read it for another week and we are coming coming close to the end of uh, the reading group. So, um, uh, knowledge retrieval, uh, document retrieval problem, given the dialogue history, retrieve the most relevant knowledge snippet from the set of all knowledge snippets ranked by the function f. So this is what they're using for uh, the ranking of all knowledge snippets, um, which is interesting because they are, okay, so the big difference between their approach in task one and task two is in task one, first they extract the knowledge and then they rank it, and in and it's only going to be things that mention the same entity. And then for task two, they're ranking all of the knowledge if they know that the person is asking for knowledge. So there's no database stuff and there's no generated answers. There is only stuff from the knowledge base. <laughs> Why is it so complex? Um, I mean, presumably because it, it worked well for them in this, in this shared task. Um, and I mean, just because something has a lot of moving parts doesn't necessarily, or like has a lot of components, doesn't necessarily mean that it's going to be uh, slower or worse performing. Uh, particularly if the alternative is to make a bunch of GPT-2 calls. Um, so I, like, I don't think there's inherently anything wrong with a system that is complex if the task that it's doing is complex. All right, um, what is this function? So it's the probability of selecting a knowledge snippet um, given a domain or an entity where uh, the entity is discussed in the domain, the domain is in the set of entities, um, therefore the selected knowledge snippet. Okay, so it's just a... a probability of selection of the knowledge snippet. Uh, okay. We propose that we first recognize the possible target domains and entities. Okay, so here's where they're doing the domain selection. And estimate the relevance of the domains to the dialogue history before choosing the appropriate knowledge snippet, since it can dramatic, drastically narrow the search space for knowledge snippets. In other words, factorization reduces the problem of task two into three subtasks, 
for each of which models can be trained for target discrimination. Okay, I see, I see. So the uh so the the thing that they are using to rank it is the probability of uh this is the probability of the domain given the utterance and the probability of a specific knowledge segment given the domain and the utterance. Um Additional information about that, purse the output of model one, which is the set of extracted domains and entity candidates. Uh, and they are estimated using module two and three, respectively. The three modules are described in the following sections. Okay. Uh, the computation of the factored probabilities naturally resorts to natural language understanding models. We employ BERT as the NLU backbone and propose knowledge factor, a factorized approach to domain entity and knowledge selection. Uh, three neural language models are developed, BERT for domain and entity model, BERT for domain model, and BERT for knowledge model. Okay, so basically they're breaking it down into a bunch of smaller problems uh, where they look at the utterance. And they're like, hey, what's the domain? Hey, what's the entity? Hey, what's the knowledge given all of this uh, stuff that we've done previously combined all together? Yeah. Okay, uh, I think that makes sense. And the reason that they're not doing this whole ranking in the first section when they're deciding whether or not to do it or not is probably just because this takes a little bit longer and it means looking at more things. Um, I think the big problem with this particular approach is that if something is in the target domain but doesn't mention an entity, um, then I don't know how they're going to be able to uh, get this KDEAK to work because it looks like the way that they're generating information relies on having an, an, an accurate entity extracted from the text. All right, and then uh, section three is just going to be how they're how they're generating re generating responses, which I think I'm just going to not talk about because I uh, probably would not recommend that as an approach. Uh, I'd use a template, or I would. Well, what would I do? Because you're not really necessarily getting templatic information back. I'd probably be like, um, honestly, what I would do is I would say like, uh, I'm not entirely sure but I found some information that might be helpful and then I would just uh, offer up the whole knowledge snippet. Um, so we do something similar in Sarah uh, where if we can't find an exact match if, for like an FAQ that somebody asks. So Sarah is our assistant that we have in the docs um, who is currently um, uh, offline because we're, we're working on it. Um, so if Sarah can't match something to like an FAQ then what we'll do is we'll uh, search for the most relevant results from the documentation using our, our search function. Um, so the uh, the thing that I would probably do is I would probably just use this first thing. Um, again, I like the entailment response. I think the entailment response does make sense. The entailment approach does make sense. Um, and then I would just be like, hey, this information might be relevant. And then I just serve them the whole knowledge snippet that I ranked as the most likely knowledge snippet uh, given the entailment with the caveat that it's only going to work if we correctly extract an entity, but also I think it's only going to um, ever detect that someone is looking at a knowledge base if they extract an entity, so... Yeah. Uh, <laughs> Robbie says, information papers should be infographics. I mean, research papers are written for other researchers, and uh, it is a very effective way of transmitting specialized knowledge um, to people that also have the background. So I think it is, um, if you are, if you don't have a research background, it can definitely be uh, frustrating to read research papers, but they kind of aren't written for people who don't have a research background, which um, I think is it's just true, right? It is true of the uh, of the of the domain of research papers. So that's my that's my thing there. So uh, sounds like entanglement. Like qu quantum entanglement. I don't think it's super relevant. Um. Uh, 
Yeah. And then they're they're going to talk about uh, response generation, which again, I, I probably wouldn't use. Uh, and then they uh, stick them all together and then they have a bunch of uh, evaluations of the different uh, types of tasks and how they did. And then they have their results and oh, oh wow, looks like their system did better. I think I, I make fun of this part, the section of, uh, of papers a little bit because usually it's like, if the paper was published, it's usually because they did better than the systems that they're comparing themselves to. Um, so. Uh, oh, interesting. So here we have uh, the an example of the ranking. Um, so what type of payments do you accept? And then uh, we take cash, master, visa, MasterCard, and debit card. So this one is what was ranked as the top snippet by their ranking system, the one that used um, the the factorized probability of, of the domain and everything. And the actual ground truth was uh, what charges are included as rates, uh, is the uh, information about tipping, and... Uh... Oh, interesting. Interesting. So this was by their ranking system retrieved as the third snippet, but their um, response generation, sorry, this is very small, but their response generation generated a uh, correct response given this input. So I guess this might be part of the reason why they have such a complex system is that they get better results with it. But also you would pick a, you would pick an example that showed that your system got better results. I love a paper with an error analysis. Yeah, I just say this is a really well written paper. I don't know if I, I've mentioned that, but really just a joy to read. Um, yeah, really, really solid work. Like I, I do have questions as I'm going through and reading it, but I, I think that's more to uh, uh, me being interested. Uh, and then like a bunch of stuff that they're doing and then blue scores, which I'm just going to ignore. Although they do also include Meteor and Rouge L, which, uh, I quite like to have the, the multiple metrics, but, um, I, for dialogue systems, I want human evaluation, which there was in the, uh, in the task. So, uh, I'm just going to skip those. Uh, yeah. And then, uh, fending. Overall, I would say uh, no appendices. Interesting approach, really interesting approach. Um, yeah, so I think if you are interested in sort of applying this um, for your own work, uh, the, the sort of barest bones of it uh, would be to, um, How would I convert this into something in Raza? I would probably, rather than having their whole first segment here, and of course these tasks were, were specified by the people who developed the shared tasks. So I think what I would do is instead of having a whole big pipeline here, I would have a fallback policy. So um, because in Raza, of course, you have the, the information about your your and I'll use certainty about what the response should be or certainty about what it thinks the user is saying and if it's not super certain uh, then I might trigger this as part of the fallback policy if I had a knowledge base to be like uh okay so did I have any entities if I had any entities go to my knowledge base look up everything that had that entity bring them all back to me rank them by this sort of BART model um which is maybe a little bit overkill uh depending on on your application it might be a little bit a little bit chunky, uh, might make your, your VM image a little bit big, but again, depends on your application, um, and then rank those and then return the top one and be like, hey, I'm not entirely sure what you meant, but this could be it. Um, and I think the, the biggest difference there is, um, the biggest difference between that and what we do in Sarah, which is uh, um, available uh, publicly on our GitHub, if you'd like to see an example of a one of the assistants that we work on internally um, is that I believe that for us, the ranking and the document retrieval is done by searching within our docs using our 
I forget what we use for like searching within our documents, but we use the document as the knowledge base. And then the thing that we ret retrieve for you is the relevant, um, hopefully the relevant is the, the top, result, top result from the search rankings. So as opposed to using this uh, uh, natural language inference entailment ranking. So I think that's the biggest difference between what we do in, um, in Sarah and their approach here. Uh, can one just jump into research papers? Uh, it gives you a lot of terms to look up to learn more. Yeah, I would say if you're very serious about reading um, a lot of research in a particular field, I would read a textbook in that field first because it will help you have a better understanding of uh, the terminology that's likely to be used and also the sort of background knowledge that they would expect you to have, right? Like they don't talk about what an entity classifier is, they just sort of like expect that you're going to know that um, as an, an NLP researcher because who else would read an NLP research paper? I think is there the sort of general thought process there. Um, so for uh, NLP in particular, I recommend speech and language processing as an intro textbook. Pull that up. I would say it's pretty much the default textbook that most people use, uh, and it is available online for free. Well, most of it. Uh, I think some of the, the chapters in the most recent edition are not, not quite done yet. Uh, but speech and language processing, and then um, from there finding, finding papers. Uh, if I were a researcher, I would never read this type of paper. You'd never read a a systems paper if you're a researcher? Uh, I mean, shared tasks aren't for everybody, and I definitely, um, like, I get that, but I mean, I think if you were working in in dialogue systems, task-oriented dialogue systems, it would be very reasonable for you to read this paper. But I guess it would depend on, on what field you're working in. I don't think, like, a lot of field archaeologists are going to be, you know, reading this to help with dating pot shirts or whatever because it's just not relevant but uh if you don't like reading can you become a researcher uh it's a big part of the job um i would say being a researcher is um uh reading and writing are major parts of the workload so if you don't enjoy reading research papers being a researcher may not be for you All right, um, so I'm gonna wrap it up there. Um, interesting paper, uh, it's uh, available. The, the link is in the, the YouTube description. Um, <laughs> uh, Subak says, uh, what would you research if you don't read? It's a good question, it's a good question. Um, yeah, just as a, just an aside about sort of doing research. I think that a lot of people have this idea that it's a very, um, based on like movies and popular media and stuff that it's a very solitary thing and you sort of like you go away and you do your own thing and you discover something amazing and you come out and you're like hey I found it. Um, research is extremely social right so you are working within a discipline with other people um, who are working on related things and it's really it's a conversation. Um, research is a very slow conversation where everybody goes out and like spends a bunch of time getting information to make their point in the next turn of the conversation um, and I think that's a really helpful way to think about research papers and it would be deeply weird if you just like butted into the middle of a conversation ignoring all context and was like I found a strawberry like, it would be cute if you were, like, a kid, but it would be rude if you were doing it to, like, you know, your colleagues. Um, and you can see, like, they read a lot of papers to, to write this paper um, and to understand what was going on and to sort of, like, be like, okay, these are where these ideas come from. So, it's, I, there's definitely, like, this sort of, like, lone genius stereotype of what doing research is like, and it is, especially in computational fields, absolutely not like that. All right. Uh, Nick says, I read the book and uh, watched the YouTube uh, lectures. Oh, the speech and language processing? Yeah. It's a, it's a solid textbook. Uh, and those are only the ones they referenced. Yeah, definitely. Uh, getting a research degree is a lot of reading. A lot of reading. All right. Um, with that, we'll be back tomorrow for live coding, same time, 9 a.m. Pacific. 
I will be working on bugs. <laughs> <laughs> we had a problem with our uh, with our, our database queries, actually, that um, our assistant was doing. So we'll, we'll try and figure out what's going on there. Um, and then we'll be back on next Wednesday with office hours. So come with your questions. It will be Yenny, our, one of our fantastic engineering managers. Um, and she's a, oh, wow, my voice is going. Yeah, I think it's time to wrap it up. <clears throat> uh, so I will be back tomorrow, be back Wednesday, uh, and I will see you then. Talk to you later. Bye.